How many of you have ever trained a dog or a horse or any other type of animal? Anybody? Mm-hmm. Can you imagine the chaos and mess it would be to have a dog in the house that has not been trained? Mm. Um, let's watch a video. It's only a little over two minutes that will give us some instruction. Watch this. House training your puppy really just boils down to a few basic principles. One, you need to have a proper setup and use management tools. What you're gonna want is a short-term confinement area, a crate, and you're gonna use that for as long as you believe your puppy can hold its bladder. If you're doing outdoor training, you don't necessarily need to have a long-term confinement area, but if your puppy's really young and not going outside yet, or your schedule doesn't allow for you to bring your puppy to potty breaks frequently enough, then you're gonna have a long-term confinement area. A long-term confinement area is a place where your puppy can do no wrong. You're gonna have, in that long-term confinement area, an indoor legal toilet for your puppy to eliminate on in the event that you can't bring them to the toilet yourself. Often we use wee-wee pads or newspaper, some sort of an absorbent surface. You wanna start by covering the entire surface with the pads or newspaper. This way you are setting your puppy up for 100% success. They can't make a mistake. As time goes on, give it a week, don't rush it, you'll start removing a little bit of the pad or substrate slowly so that you can ensure that your puppy is actually targeting the pad. Eventually your goal might be to have more floor and only one pad. But take your time and if your puppy ever makes a mistake, then you're just gonna put a little bit more toilet surface down for your puppy. The next thing you absolutely have to remember is if your puppy is not in their crate or their long-term confinement area and they're out and about with you, you are gonna supervise them 100% of the time. And when I talk about supervision, I don't mean just watching your puppy run around the living room floor and weeing in the corner. I mean really keeping your puppy close to you. The only time they're gonna be running out and about and getting a little exercise and fun is right after they've gone to the bathroom. That way you know your puppy is empty and you're setting yourself and your puppy up for success of not having accidents in your house. The way that you can supervise them is keeping them on a long, lightweight indoor leash. This way your puppy is always tethered to you. And as time goes on, if you feel that your puppy might need to go to the bathroom, you're gonna tighten up the supervision, maybe even put him in your lap or on a little pad at your feet, chewing a toy. And then when you believe it's time for them to go to the potty, you're either going to bring them outdoors, if you're outdoor training, or to their legal indoor toilet. What was that video when I needed it? <laughs> <laughs> Did you notice that the trainer said, you want to set up your puppy for 100% of success so that they cannot make a mistake? Did you notice how closely she held the puppy? Did you notice the leash that she had on the puppy? Did you notice the confining area that she had for the puppy? All of which was designed to eventually, as the puppy matured, to roam the house responsibly. This word, padia, means to child train. So as we continue our series on in training, recognizing the divine in discipline, we're looking at the word padia, which means to child train. It is the picture of a parent training a child or a tutor training a student, or an experienced journeyman training a protege, or a former training an animal. It is a picture of God training us, holding us close, compassionately, setting us up for 100% of 
success. Most people still think that discipline is God punishing them for something they do wrong. He certainly does correct us, but it is way, way more than that. In fact, most of God's child training has nothing to do with us doing wrong. So if you are going through a difficult time, please understand that God is not trying to tear you down. No, no, no. I want you to get that. Look at the person next to you and say, no, no, no. Uh, Y'all didn't wave your hand over here. Say, no, no, no. He is not trying to tear you down. He is trying to train you up. Because he wants us to roam this world freely, responsibly, to bring him glory, to bring good to others, and to grow to our highest potential. There is no joy to gain without pain. There is no joy to gain without pain. Pain. Let's see what the Hebrew writer says, Hebrews 12. As you endure this divine child training, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never child trained by its father or mother? For our earthly fathers child trained us for a few years doing the best they knew how. But God's child training is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No child training is enjoyable while it is happening. It is what? Painful. But afterward, but afterward, there will be a peaceable harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. Here's the sermon in ascendance. The Lord's child training has three purposes. One is preventative. Two is corrective. Three is reformative. The Lord's child training has three purposes. One is preventative. He wants to help us avoid negative consequences. The other is corrective. When we don't avoid negative consequences, he wants to restore us from negative consequences. And the third is reformative. He wants to reshape our thinking, our beliefs, because our beliefs impact our behavior. Some of us keep making the same mistakes because of faulty beliefs. And God wants to reform that. He wants to reshape that. That's his three purposes. Protective or preventative to avoid negative consequences. Corrective in order to um, help us restore from negative consequences. And thirdly, he does it reformative to reshape our thinking, our philosophies, our beliefs, because that is what in fact impacts our behavior. I want to have two points today, <clears throat> then I'll go to my seat. Number one, discipline is designed at times to inflict pain to gain our attention. Discipline at times is designed to gain, to inflict pain in order to gain our attention. If I'm honest with myself, if you're honest with yourself, when God is blessing me with prosperity and I'm on an upward climb, I tend not to pay too much attention. But when I'm afflicted, then he gets my undivided attention. So the root word to padeo means to strike. It means to whip. 
It is the same word used when Jesus was whipped by the Romans as he was on the way to the cross. He was struck. He was whipped on our behalf, inflicting pain in order to gain our attention. And so sometimes God inflicts pain to gain our attention. It's not just physical pain. It's not just emotional pain. It could be financial pain. It could be relational pain, all designed as he's holding us close, keeping us on a leash, confining us, ultimately so we can mature and roam responsibly. I remember my stepdad taught me this lesson. He child trained me, and I had to experience some financial pain. Before I married as a young man, I, he bought me a car, 1977 LTD2, blue and cream top, cream interior. And he told me this. He said, now, boy, this car will always be good to you if you check your brake fluid, if you check your transmission fluid, and if you check your uh, oil. Check those fluids every month. And, of course, I didn't. And two years later, I put my car in reverse, and it sputtered. Then I put it in drive, and it sputtered. Took it to the mechanic. He said, you know what? You need a new transmission. And a rebuilt one will cost you about $2,000. Uh, I didn't have $2,000. So where did I go? To my stepdad. I said, would you... Would you let me borrow $2,000? He said, for what? I need a new rebuild. I need a rebuild transmission. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he said, no. And I was mad. Mad at who? Him. Not me. <laughs> I was mad. And so for the next couple of months, I had to ride the bus, hustle rides with friends. I couldn't go out trying to save money, no entertainment, no fun. About two months later, he came and said, how much have you saved up? I said, about $1,000. He said, when you get the 1500 bucks, I will, um, I'll go ahead and give you another 500 and you can get a rebuilt transmission. Then I was glad. <laughs> you see how fickle we are? You know what he was doing? He was child training me, inflicting financial pain to gain my attention. And to this day, I've been a much better steward of things, especially cars, because that's what God is trying to do to us. And sometimes, let me speak a word to parents, younger par or parents with younger children in particular. Sometimes we have misinterpreted the idea that the Bible talks about the rod of correction. We have misinterpreted, misunderstood that, and sometimes thrown the baby out with the bath water. But when the Bible talks about this correction using a rod, physical pain to inflict, uh, inflicting physical pain to gain our attention, it does not mean what a lot of my foreparents thought it meant. A rod was generally something very specific. It was different in size or shape depending on the, the, uh, the person or the size of the person, depending on what the intent was. It was visible so people could see it. It was known this is a rod for correction so that it's visible and I'm passing by it every day. It's a, it's a reminder. And that's how they use the rod. Let's say what Proverbs 29, 15 says. A rod of correction imparts wisdom, but a youth left to himself or herself is a disgrace to his mother. 22, 15. Foolishness is bound to the heart of a youth or child. A rod of child training will separate foolishness from him. Proverbs 13, 24, the one who will not use the rod hates his son or daughter, but the one who loves him child trains or disciplines him 
diligently keep that up for a minute as you look at the word hate. This is not hate or despise as we know it. It means that the person is not loving as well as they could their child. When the word talks about diligently, it means they are doing it thoughtfully and not angrily. So sometimes pain in training involves physical discipline. For parents, we call that spanking, spanking today. Now, I admit that when I was growing up, my four parents and others did not always understand the rod. It was not some specific thing in a specific place sized appropriately. No, they found whatever they could. It could be an extension card, a broom, a mop, a belt. And then they would traumatize this young boy by saying, go cut me a switch from the tree. And I'm out there wondering, did I cut one too big? No, that's going to hurt. If I cut it too little, they're going to come out and cut one too big. Oh, no wonder I had to go to a psychiatrist. <laughs> so I cut something in between. But listen, when you're doing it properly, let me give you three things if you're raising smaller children. One, spanking was always the last resort, not the first retort. Always the last resort, not the first response. In fact, there are eight different things the Bible tells us to do before you get to spanking. One of them is First, you tell, instruct. It's new information. The second thing is you teach by example. You show them how to do it. Long before you get to the physical pain. So he says, it's the last response, not the first response. When I was growing up, it was pretty much the first response. <laughs> Don't do that. Here's the second Spanking was reserved for intentional rebellion, not accidental mistakes. It was reserved for intentional rebellion, not accidental mistakes. I have actually seen parents who mean well out in public, a child spills a glass of water on a restaurant or milk or makes an accident, and the first response is the rod. Don't do that. It is intentional rebellion not accidental mistakes aren't you glad God does not physically impose pain every time we make a mistake no he in fact when you go through the book of Proverbs he's telling 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 teach 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 listen 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 and then spanking should not be done at the point of anger it should not be done at the point of anger. You need to step aside, cool off, and then come back, as the word says, diligently, thoughtfully, not angrily. And my stepdad would say, or my grandmom would say, now this is going to hurt you more than it hurt me. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but when you're doing it right, it does hurt you that you have to take this kind of corrective measure. We discovered in our home, trying our best, though imperfectly, to impart these principles, that we rarely had to use the rod. Especially for my second and third child. My favorite youngest daughter rarely got the rod because she looked at her brother and sister and said, uh-uh, that is not going to happen to me. <laughs> and we rarely had to, to do it. Inflict pain to gain our attention. Here's the second thing. Discipline is designed to strain and stretch us in order to strengthen us. It's designed to strain us, to stretch us, so that we can be strengthened. So I, I brought my little dumbbell here today. And um, I try to use these. I'm not trying to get buff 
like uh, Jimmy Moore or like um, Sean Lloyd or like um, um, several others around here. I just want to be able to pick up my grandkids. <laughs> I just want to be able to pick up a chair every now and then. <laughs> but there is no strength without strain. No strength without stretching. And it's all designed so that we can be stronger for the journey. And that's what God does with you, and that's what he does with me. Proverbs says this, child training, or child train your child, discipline your child, and it will bring you peace of mind and give you delight. Give you delight. So God stretches us. He strains us sometimes to the point of almost exhaustion. God, I can't take it anymore. But oh, he knows how much we can bear. Tutors stretch their students intellectually, push them beyond the points they thought they could go. The military stretches a soldier to the point of exhaustion, stretching them in order to strengthen them for the battle ahead. I'll close with this in Hebrews 11. Come before Hebrews 12. And it feeds into Hebrews 12. Hebrews 11 is a list of characters. We call them heroes in the faith. And these are heroes in the faith who've experienced God's child training. Most of the time, it was not because they had done anything wrong. It was because he was straining them. He was stretching them so they could be strengthened for the future. Let me give you three, and I'll go to my seat. One was Abraham. Abraham was 75 years old when God told him to leave his family, leave his relatives, leave his culture, and go to a land that I will show you, and I'm going to give you a son. His wife was barren, uh, Sarah, who was 10 years younger. She could not have children. But he said, you are going to have a child from Sarah. But it took 25 years. During that 25 years, God stretched him and strained him, but eventually gave him a child from Sarah, though she was barren, and it strengthened them so that they now could train young Isaac, who would then be the progenitor for the nation of Israel. You can imagine a time in that 25 years when Abraham thought it was never going to be to the point of exhaustion, and he almost gave up. And then his grandson, Joseph, 13 years, going through pain and stretching and strain at 17 years old, sold by his brothers down in Egypt, in the pit, in the palace, in the prison, and for 13 years he went through difficult times, but he lived to be 110, so for the next 80 years he was able to prepare and save the nation that God would later call to be Israel. Let me, let me ask you a question. If you knew you had to go through 13 years of hell, 13 years of stretching, 13 years of straining in order to be strengthened for the next 80 years, would you take that deal? I know I would. <laughs> Some of you are looking at me right now. You are in a stage of being spiritually suspended, stretched, strained, almost to the point of exhaustion. But God is up to something. It's always too soon to quit. He's holding you close, compassionately, has you on a leash, confining you. But it's all designed for you to mature so you can roam about responsibly to bring him glory, good to others, and grow to your highest potential. Can I give you another one? Moses, 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years being spiritually suspended, 40 years being strained and stretched, all designed for him to strengthen a nation, to inherit a promised land. 
So I don't know what you're going through right now, but I do know this. The one who is child training, if we can trust our earthly fathers and mothers who did the best they knew how, how much more can we trust God who always child trains us for the good? I may not understand it right now. I certainly will not like it right now. But he's always up to something much bigger than myself. Let's pray together. I want to challenge you in this prayer to do some remembering. Here's about eyes are closed. I want you to remember no pain to gain. A no joy to gain without pain. Can you think of a time in your life that's already happened where you experienced a time where God stretched you, strained you, almost to the point of giving up, and yet you were strengthened for the journey ahead? Can you think of that? time in your life where you can honestly say today I can agree with no joy to gain without pain now I want you to think about what you may be going through now or maybe a loved one may be going through now maybe you can be of encouragement to them And say, despite you being stretched and strained right now, God is not trying to tear you down. He's trying to train you up. And remember what he did in the past. Because he will set you up in the future to be strengthened and to do what you could never have done without being stretched. So, Father, we thank you that you you love us. And we love you because you first loved us. Now some of us are going through some difficult times, enduring suffering. It may be our fault. It may not be, but it doesn't matter because you are in control of child training us. So when we have not taken preventative measures, you would then take corrective measures and reformative measures to reshape our beliefs. So that whatever we're going through now or will go through, help us never to forget that you inflict pain at times to gain our attention, but you also stretch and strain us so we can gain strength. Help us to trust your heart even when we don't understand your hand. In the name of the King of kings and Lord of lords, even Jesus, our Savior, do we pray. In fact, we praise you. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We love to pray for you and celebrate alongside you. Please share anything going on in your life with us at HopeChurchMemphis.com slash prayer and subscribe to the Hope Church Memphis YouTube channel to experience previous worship services and more. Have a great week.